Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We come with great expectation and great excitement. As we know that what we have today is very enriching Bible study. And Lord, we pray that you will keep every one of us active and alive. So that we will not doze off in our minds. Our mind will not wander at all. As we have this great study before us today. We thank you for all that we have been learning in the past in this book of Exodus. We thank you because of the encouragement, because of the strength, because of the power, and because of the insight you have given unto us. We thank you, Father, because we have come to a realization, a revelation of your might as we have looked at this book of Exodus. And today as we come today, we are still believing that more than what we have ever known, more than what we have ever studied, in this book of Exodus, you are going to reveal unto us today. Lord, already we are even praising your name because we know you are going to do it. We come, O oh Lord, humbly. Knowing that in ourselves, we are nothing. In ourselves, we know nothing. We depend so much upon you. We depend so much upon your spirit. So that you will open our eyes and reveal wondrous things to us out of this passage of study today, in Jesus' name. Lord, we do not want to have just head knowledge. We want to be able to move from the understanding to the experience. Therefore, Lord, we pray that the good of all that we are studying today will be ours, O Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that through this study today, that you will open our eyes of understanding, that you will make us to see afresh the importance, the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, where anybody has lacked assurance, that you grant assurance to us in Christ, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that from what we learn today, from what we study today, we'll also be well equipped to be able to help other people to know the Lord Jesus Christ more. Teach us, Lord, today. We're looking up to you, we're waiting upon you. And we're praying, O oh Lord, that will never be the same again as you reveal yourself and reveal the deep truth of redemption to us in the story today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered and we'll definitely see the impact of this study in our lives, not only today, but for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study that we have today. We have an important study today. And we're coming to Exodus chapter 12. As you will see from your Bible, Exodus chapter 12 is so very long. It has 51 verses. And it is not possible to do a thorough study if we try to be in a hurry and we just rush over all the verses of this chapter. So we're going to look at the first 13 verses today. Before I read these 13 verses with you, let me just uh, give you this general kind of comment concerning the chapter that we are before us. This chapter relates a significant event in the history of the children of Israel. In fact, as you look at the children of Israel, I will tell you this, that all things that we have learned in this book of Exodus has actually been pointing to or looking forward to this chapter of deliverance and redemption we are before us today. And in fact, it also seems that all things after this supernatural redemption will be pointing back to the great divine intervention we're reading in Exodus chapter 12. Now, what I mean is this. As you read through the book of Exodus, you'll find, for example, in Exodus chapter 20, pointing back to when God delivered them out of the land of Egypt. When you read Leviticus, there are some verses. When you read in Numbers, there are some verses also that will point back to Exodus chapter 12 and will call upon the children of Israel, remember, remember, remember what the Lord did for you in bringing you out of the iron furnace, out of the bondage in Egypt. In redeeming your life, when you read Deuteronomy, it points back to this event in Exodus chapter 12. Always telling the people that I loved you, I had compassion upon you, I redeemed you by the blood of the Lamb. 
always pointing back to what we're going to study today. In fact, do you know that it's not only in all these books, when you come to Joshua, and when you come to other books of the Old Testament, in fact, the prophets did this a number of times. And they will remind the children of Israel how God delivered that nation out of the captivity of Egypt. In fact, when you come onto the New Testament, you'll find some verses in the New Testament coming back or turning back to Exodus chapter 12. It's so very significant then that all things before this chapter have been pointing to and looking forward to what we're studying today. And even after this a particular chapter, many things still looking back to that climactic experience of the children of Israel. That is why it's so important then. Think about this way. Were it possible to remove this chapter from the Pentateuch? That is, to remove this chapter from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Just pull out Exodus chapter 12 alone. You know what will happen. All that you have left may just become meaningless and purposeless. How would you be able to interpret the covenant of God with Abraham in Genesis without this chapter? How will you know the faithfulness of God to what God had promised Abraham without this chapter we're looking at today? How will you be able to know the compassion of God for the people that he has loved, for the descendants of Abraham without this chapter? And then if you turn on to other passages of scripture after Exodus chapter 12, when it says, I redeemed you, and I called you out of Egypt, and I did this for you. And as a result of that, he gave them the Ten Commandments. I'm asking you, if Exodus chapter 12 is removed, what will be the foundation of the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel? You see then that this chapter is very, very significant. And lack of understanding of the contents of this chapter will leave us ignorant of much of the old testament in fact here is what we learn israel's forgetfulness concerning this great event always led them to wander into idolatry and slavery whenever the children of israel kept this chapter before them whenever the children of israel remember this great act of god for them they always kept intact they always kept in true worship but whenever they forgot the redemption of god the deliverance of god that delivered them out of Egypt. Whenever they forgot the content of this chapter, they always wandered back into idolatry and slavery. This is the greatest type also of our redemption. In the new covenant, above all the other types in the Old Testament. Now what I mean is this. When you think about our salvation, you think about our redemption, you think about the forgiveness of our sins, and you think about Jesus Christ coming to redeem us. There are many things in the Old Testament that stand as illustration, as type, or as symbol of our redemption. And you find quite a lot of that in the New Testament. You find quite a lot of that, for example, in the epistle to the Hebrews. You'll find that it talks about the Levitical priesthood. It talks about the altar. It talks about the tabernacle. It talks about Aaron, it talks about Melchizedek, it talks about quite a number of things in the Hebrews. And then when you look at Romans, or you look at 1 Corinthians, or you look at other parts of the New Testament, it points back to the Old Testament, teaching us or giving us some symbols, some illustrations, and sometimes of our redemption. But as we look at all those types and all those illustrations and symbols all together, you'll find that most of the time, most of the time, the singular thing that is referred to, the great type that is referred to concerning our redemption is this redemption and deliverance of the children of Israel. Can you see then why we shouldn't hurry over Exodus chapter 12? Do you see then why we shouldn't be in a hurry to say we want to cover this chapter now so we can finish the book of Exodus in time? You see the reason why we need to take some time in this Exodus chapter 12. You see this chapter speaks so loud and speaks so convincingly concerning a number of things. Concerning God's faithfulness. Concerning God's power. Concerning God's wrath against sin. Concerning God's justice. Concerning Israel's deliverance and our own redemption. Concerning the central place of the Lamb in God's plan of redemption 
concerning the pan, the efficacy of the blood of the Lamb, concerning the required holiness demanded of the redeemed. That is why this chapter is not just, not only a pivotal point in the history of the children of Israel, it also furnishes an indispensable pillar in the grand temple of redemption truth. Let's look at this. In Exodus chapter 12, I'm reading to you, open your Bible with me. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregations of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for every one house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take each according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and it shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and on living bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodding at all with water, but roast with fire, its head with its legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Those are the 13 verses we're considering today. And for easy understanding, according to a usual practice, I'm going to divide these verses into three parts. Number one, Israel's new beginning. That's Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Number two, the spotless Lamb of God. That's in Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 to 11. And then point three, when I see the blood. When I see the blood, almost everyone knows about that quotation. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And yet there are people that just know about that verse and they know about it superficially. I dare tell you there is so much that is contained in that passage. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so we have that as point three, which is verses 12 and 13. We are pleading with the Lord as we read, as we study. As we explain, interpret, and apply, we are pleading with the Lord that the Lord himself will grant us insight. And he will assist us by the Holy Ghost. So that we will not miss what he has for us in this study tonight in Jesus' name. Let's go back to point one. Israel's new beginning, verses one and two. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. In the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
Let us once again praise the name of the Lord for the example we have in Moses and Aaron. That they never went ahead of God. They never took a decision apart from thus says the Lord. And whenever God spoke, they never re-examined what God said. They never modified what God said. And they never said, no, how reasonable is that? And you see, this is a very good example for us who are children of God. That in everything God says to us, we never modify it. We never question it. We never doubt it. We never change it. We just go by, does says the Lord. I want to tell you something here as we look at verses 1 and 2. God was making a change in the tradition, in the custom they had been following. And remember that they had been following this custom for hundreds of years. You see, they had been uh, following the calendar of Egypt. Every time they wrote a date, they wrote their date according to the calendar of Egypt. But then God was changing that custom. God was changing that tradition. And he told them, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be to thee. It shall be to you the first month of the year. Now, it's very significant that even though, think about this, they had been doing something for more than 200 years. Yet, when God said, change must come. And the change must be immediate. They never argued. They never asked the reason why. Let me remind you once again, just obey. Just obey. Never ask the reason why. When the Lord speaks to you, when he gives you the message, there is but one thing to do. Just obey. That is the beauty of the Christian life. You see, you might have been doing something for many years before you were born again. It might have been the tradition of your family. It might have been the custom of your tribe. It might have been the thing that you were doing since you were born into this world. When you become born again, when you become a child of God, and God says, change. God says, turn around. God says, don't do it that way anymore. This is the way to do it. And believing God with you, Lord, that with, like with uh, Aaron and Moses, you'll say, yes, Lord, without questioning. And you will be obedient to the word of the Lord very, very promptly. Now, let us look at this very closely. In verses 1 and 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. As I told you, this climactic event in the history of the Israelites was so great that God ordered them to begin their year on that date. Previously, they had been following the Egyptian custom. The Egyptian custom was that the new year will begin in the autumn months at the time of their harvest. The, theologi the theologians and the, historic, uh, the uh, history people tell us that that is about the middle of September when the Egyptians of those days will start their calendar. But then God told the children of Israel, the children of Israel now, he wanted them to lay aside everything that will remind them of Egypt and to become a separate people unto him. In fact, he said, even the calendar will have to change. Uh, we should learn an important lesson here. You see, God has his own reason. And it is not for you or for me to question God. If God says that he doesn't want Israel, the Israel of God, to be like Egypt in any way, in the very minute thing, in the things that appear to be of no consequence at all, we must be obedient to God. We may not understand all the reasons that God has, but once God has said it, he is wiser than we are. He is the ancient of days. He is the one from everlasting to everlasting. And he knows what is best for us. And when he commands us or tells us to change something, that thing must be changed promptly. And so then, the first day of the month of Abi, which corresponds to our own April now, the month of our own April, some theologians will put it as March, but give and take from March to April. Most theologians will say the son of Abib fell into the, falls into that period. And so they were now to number their own new year. And this is so very significant. In fact, it is repeated for the children of Israel uh, a number of times. 
I want you to look at Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day, in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall not leavened bread, leavened bread be eaten. Then he said, This day came ye out in the month of Abi. So then they were told that this was to be the new year for them. And this was to be the first month for them. Their calendar was to change because of dating their existence. Think about that. Dating their new life. Think about that. Dating their existence and their new life to the time they were delivered out of the land of Egypt. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 1. Observe the month of Abi and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abi, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Now you can see that because it was the time of their deliverance, the time of their redemption, the time they came into new life from slavery unto freedom. From bondage unto liberty. From darkness unto light. From when they were over controlled by Pharaoh to the control of God. Because of the change of masters. Because of the change of situation. Because of the change of lifestyle. Because of the change of location. Because of the change that had come upon them. The Lord said, your calendar now will date back to the time of your change. Isn't that something for us children of God? Because you know the day of our conversion is the time of the change of location. You are in darkness before now you are in, in the light. It is the time of the change of masters. You are under the dominion, under the slavery and the captivity of Satan, the taskmaster before. But now that you are born again, you are under the dominion of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Isn't there a change of life? You were living under the power of the prince of the air before. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. But now you are a child of God. There is a new spirit. There is a new life. There is a new direction. And because everything is new now, the Lord is saying, you will remember this day you are born again more than the day you are born into this world. Think about it. You were born into this world uh, maybe many years ago. But there was a time you were born into the kingdom of God. And the Lord is saying, He wants the day you were born into the kingdom of God to become more significant. To become the pivotal point. To become the reference point in your spiritual life. Look at this in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How very important. You see what is important in our lives? I hope you are learning something from here. That what God counts important, let us count important. What God counts insignificant, let us count insignificant. Do you know there are some Christians, they have not learned this great lesson. They will, uh, they will do like Herod. Herod, uh, the wicked king in uh, Matthew chapter 14. And they will have a birthday. They remember the day they came into this world of darkness, this world of evil, this world of sin. They never remember for one single moment the day they came into the kingdom of God. The day their names were written in the book of life. The day they were born again. But Jesus Christ said, actually, the significant thing in our lives is not when we are born into this world. The very significant days when we are born anew, born again, born into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. If you have been born again, that is the day you ought to remember in your life. Now, let me tell you something. Now, as we're going to study all the other verses, you will see that the Lamb that we're still going to read and study about in this uh, passage we're looking at today points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've just told you something. Now, do you know that 
I told you and I read it to you. They changed the day. That is the reckoning of the dates. They changed it at the time that Israel came out of Egypt. I'm going to ask you a question. Didn't a change come upon our calendar? I mean the reckoning of days. The reckoning of years. When Jesus came into this world. Do you know that before Jesus Christ came. That days were being reckoned in one way. How was date being reckoned? If you read the ancient history books, they will quote a particular day. They will say A.M. I don't mean the morning hours. They will also use A.M. for that. But I'm talking about the years now. If you are read in ancient history books, they will write the date and then they will say A.M. What does that mean? It means Anno Mundi, which means in the translation in the year of the world. They were, they were calculating the date from the time of creation. And therefore they will say Anno Mundi, which means in the year of the creation of the world. Mundi for the world. Now, you see, after Jesus Christ came, the change came. It is no more AM, but AD. What is AD? It's Anno Domino. What does that mean? It means in the year of the Lord. You see, the coming of Christ even changed the reference to the calendar. It even changed the writing of the date. So that from that time, that's why maybe you are not familiar with AM. Do you know why? Because all the years that have been written before Christ, we just have this particular year BC, before Christ. And then after that, this particular year AD, Anno Domino, in the, in the year of the Lord. Because, you see, the coming of Christ even changed the way we think of the calendar. Do you see the significance of this? And for the believer, that that's talking about for the whole world. Think about it. That the whole world now has a reference to the date of the calendar. In reference to the Lord Jesus Christ in the whole world. The whole world is not born again. And yet they recognize the significance of Christ coming for salvation. They recognize the significance of the Lamb of God being slain. Coming into this world. How about you then if you are born again? Wouldn't you realize what the world is trying to realize? That now you are to date your own life. You are to date your, your own existence. I mean real existence. Meaningful existence. Purposeful, purposeful existence. You are now going to date it back to the time you are born again. When Christ came into your own life. You see saved men and saved women ought to date from the dawn of their true life. Their new life. Not from the time of their first birthday, but from the day wherein they were born again of the Spirit of God. The act of salvation from sin, marking our departure from the world of sin, marking our entrance into the kingdom of God, ought to mark a new beginning for us. Therefore, let your conversion be the important date in your mind, in your memory, in your life. And let it be the burial of the old existence. The date, that is the date you are born again, is to be regarded as the beginning of life. As for that which follows after that date, after you are born again, make sure you are taking care. You are really living the real life that is worthy of the grace of God, the grace of God that has quickened you. Our life beginning as a does, at the time of our spiritual birth, spiritual new life, our spiritual Passover, what we're looking at today, or at the time we began to feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought always to remember that date of our conversion with praise unto God. Now, I'm going to tell you this, if you have not been born again, it means that God doesn't even count that you are existing. Because, you see, your existence is not purposeful and meaningful. It is that spiritual bad day. That actually means so much to God that it says, begin to reckon how old you are with how old you are in the kingdom of God. That's why you'll find some of our brothers saying, I am six months old in the Lord. They may not have known this passage we're looking at today, but that's the reason they say that. Some people will say, I praise the Lord, I'm five years old in the Lord now. And that's why they will look at somebody younger than themselves and they will say, he's older than I am in the kingdom of God. He is 10 years old in the kingdom of God. I'm only 7 years old in the kingdom of God. You know what they're doing? They're dating the real life, true life, the world life that is worth living. They're dating back to the time they really came to know the Lord. If you do not have a spiritual birthday, if you do not have a date you can point to, 
And you can say, at this particular time, I came to the Lord. Then you really need to think about this very seriously. Because it means that real life and true life has not really started with you. And it will be a good thing for you today to make this day the day of your salvation. So that you can really start living. As we look at Exodus chapter 12. I think another thing we will see here is that uh, the family was intended here. Because the family will take the lamb. The household will take the lamb. And the lamb was for the family. A family begins to live in the, in the highest sense of that word when as a family, without exception, it has, all, it has all been redeemed, all sprinkled with the blood, all made to feed on Jesus, all purged from sin, all set at liberty to go out of the domains of sin, bound for the promised land, bound for the kingdom that is promised unto the redeemed. I'm going to ask you, have you been born again? Have you started the new life? Can you refer to the date? Can you refer to the day and the time when you were actually born again? Do you remember it at all? And are you so happy that a day came in your life when you were born again? Well, the Lord said that is the day that you ought to remember more than the date you were born into this world. You see, people like Herod who are not born again, they have no other date to remember. People like Herod, who, do not know, who did not know the Lord, all they could remember was the time they came into this world of sin. And so you have them throwing parties on such a birthday. A day they came into spiritual death, into sin. It, they came into the world of sin. But as for us children of God, let us count more important. Let us exalt above every other day. The day we came into the kingdom of God. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Now we're going to look at verses 3 all through to 11. And this brings us to the next point. The spotless lamb of God. Now I've read this to you already. I just want to point out something to you. To start with. I want to show you that this passage is actually referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, as you look at the New Testament, you see that the essential thing that we want to get out of this passage is the way it points to Christ. The way it, it symbolizes or typifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at John. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, if you know your Bible very well, you see that the Lamb has been very central in the redemptive plan of God. I just want to remind you, in Genesis chapter 22, you have the mention of the Lamb. The Lord will provide himself a Lamb for the sacrifice. In this Exodus chapter 12, we find the Lamb. Every household will take the Lamb. And then you find in Leviticus, we find the lamb that will bring the lamb. You lay hands upon it to confess your sin and you bring it unto the priest. And then it will be slain. The blood will be shed because the blood is given for the atonement. And then in the time of the kings and all through the time of the Old Testament, the people of Israel, you will see that the lamb was sacrificed upon every upon their altars. You'll find at the time of Solomon, for example, that it says thousands of animals, thousands of lambs were slain and offered unto the Lord as a bond offering. You come unto Isaiah chapter 53, it talks about the lamb that is laid a very dumb as it, before a shearer and taken to be slain. And then it says our iniquities are laid upon him. Eventually you have this being fulfilled. As John looked at Jesus Christ coming the following day, and it says, Behold, all the lambs you have been reading about, all the sacrificial system you have been reading about in the Old Testament, it says it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In the passage we have read today, you will find something very significant about that Lamb. The significant thing is this, that the Lamb will be without blemish. That's what you find in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep 
or from the goats. Then it says that it will be without blemish. How was that fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ? First Peter chapter 1 from verse 18 to verse 19. First Peter chapter 1 from verse 18 to verse 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So then you see that the lamb we're reading about in Exodus chapter 12 actually is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very, very significant. Never forget that. Always study there the importance of it, the significance of it, the interpretation of it for us is that it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you know that that whole uh, sacrifice, everything is referred to as the Passover. I want you to come back to Exodus chapter 12 and look at verse 11. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it, referring to eating the lamb, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in his. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. Notice that it is the Lord's Passover. Why is it called? It is the, why it is called the Lord's Passover? Because as a result of that lamb being slain, as a result of the blood being shed, as a result of the blood being sprinkled, and then it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the judgment and the plague will not come in to afflict anyone or to destroy anyone, because I will pass over you. That is why it is called the Passover. I want you to realize that the New Testament refers to that very incident and that very event. And then it tells us that it is pointing to, it is referring to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb, as ye are unliving. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Do you see that? And this is the interpretation of the New Testament itself. That the New Testament is telling us that what we study in Exodus chapter 12. All these verses were reading about the Lamb. The Lamb without blemish is actually pointing to in its perfection. In fulfillment is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now let's come back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. I pointed out to you that all this passage is actually referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a symbol, it's an illustration, it's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at it from verse 3. It says in verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. You want to notice here that this is uh, planned by the Lord. It wasn't with the intelligence of man. It wasn't with the understanding of man. This is not the wisdom of man. It is telling us that redemption in Christ, salvation in Christ, was not the plan of the Jews, was not the plan of wise people, was not the plan of religious people. Salvation in Christ is the very plan of God. You will see that this lamb they were to take out. It was the very plan of God. God says, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel. He was telling them, this is the only way of salvation. This is the only way of deliverance. This is the only way of redemption. Let us understand that salvation was planned by God. Salvation was planned by the love of God. By the love of God. And so we need to understand that salvation message or the redemption plan is not the idea of a man, the idea of a group of people, the idea of some Jewish people. This is the very plan of God. If you have received Jesus Christ as that lamb, 
as your substitute. As the one to take away your sin. If you have received Jesus Christ as your own redem as your redemption. Or as the one that has redeemed you, your redeemer. I want to tell you that you have received the very plan of God, not the plan of man. Verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. I want you to realize that it never says the lamb may be too little for the household, but it said the household may be too little for the lamb. What does that tell us? It tells us that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient for the whole human race. It's sufficient for every family in every nation. And we cannot say that there is a particular group that the blood of Jesus cannot cover. There is a particular group of people that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, cannot be sufficient for. The Lamb was never too small for a family, but a family might be too small for the Lamb. And then they were told that if the family was too small, if the household was too small, do you know what they will do? This is picturing the very fact that we should remember the other people too, they need to be saved. We should remember the other people too, they need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We need to remember others too that as we need the Lamb of God to take away our sins and He has taken away our sins, we should remember the other household too that they need the Lamb of God to take away their sin. Isn't this picturing for us that we in our household, if we have known the Lord, will check up the next door neighbor, will check up the next house, they too they need to know the Lord. You say, will He be sufficient for every one of us? Oh yes, behold the Lamb of God. We takes away the sin of the whole world. The sin of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see that only begotten son is sufficient for the whole world. In verse 5 it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. And ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. It says that lamb will be without blemish. Already appointed to you according to the New Testament. That Jesus Christ is that lamb. Already appointed to you too that is without blemish. Let us look at Hebrews chapter 7 verses 25 and 26. The very fact that Jesus Christ is without spot. Is without blemish. Is without sin. In fact he challenged the people at his own time. And he said, which of you convinces me of sin? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 and 26 concerning Jesus Christ. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that cometh unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is, listen to this, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. The lamb without blemish, holy. The lamb without blemish, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And then we're told that the children of Israel will take that lamb and take it apart. Well, you know that Jesus Christ has been set apart for our redemption, even from the foundation of the world. Uh, can you see how this, whole, how this whole thing on the Passover is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ? And then you see in verse 6, I'm back to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now this verse alone, I mean verse 6, we don't have time to go into the depth of the fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But... Um, some theologians have done a wonderful work on this. You know what they have done? They have taken their, the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The last few chapters. That is from Matthew. If you look at it from the last chapters, uh, then from Mark, from Luke, from John. They have closely, minutely compared all the verses there. Do you know what they have discovered? They discovered that Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem. And from that time, he rode into Jerusalem. He limited his public ministry. He was now with his disciples mainly. And then also they noticed that 
at the time of the Passover. And if you have time, you can read from Mark chapter 14 and some other uh, closing chapters of the Synoptic Gospels. From uh, those passages, you see that it was at the very time when the Passover should have been killed. In that evening, at that time, that actually Jesus Christ was crucified. And as they have studied the minute details, they have seen if this is the wisdom of God. Only God could have arranged this. Now, uh, you may say that, uh, but Jesus Christ took the Passover himself. Because if you look at that passage, you will see where he sent it to his two disciples and said, Go on, as a good master of the house, where will the master keep the Passover before he dies, before he goes? And you will see that he kept the Passover. But as the theologians have compared all the verses, they, they have noticed that he took that Passover a little before the other people took the Passover because the law of the children of Israel allowed that, especially when the time of the Passover will clash with the observance of the, of the Sabbath day. Well, that may be too much for some people. But the point is this, that Jesus Christ fulfilled in every detail. In every detail. All that we're studying over here. Let's go now to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 7. And it says in verse 7, And they shall take of the blood, and strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door, on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. We'll come to that when we get to point number 3. But now look at verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in the night and roast with fire and with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Now it says they will also eat the flesh of that lamb. What does that signify to us? You remember that John chapter 6, Jesus Christ was talking to the people and he was telling them uh, something very significant which is like the fulfillment of what we have just read now. They were saved by the blood, redeemed by the blood, and they were protected by the blood. But then they were nourished and strengthened by the flesh of the lamb that they ate. If you come, by, if you come to John chapter 6, very quickly, come to John chapter 6, you will see what Jesus Christ himself said concerning himself. He said in verse 48, I am the bread of life. It says in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Can you see that? Can you see that? But then when the children of Israel, the Jews at that time, when they misunderstood what he said, he cleared it up for them. Reading now from verse uh, 62. It says, what? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, those Jews were confused when he said they will eat his flesh. They didn't know he was just referring to what we're studying today in the Old Testament. But actually, it was the word that he spoke. Because, you know, Christ is the word personified is the living word in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god and then he now says the words i speak unto you their spirit and their life so then as we have come to exodus chapter 12 verse 8 when it says they ate the flesh of the lamb how do you understand that today let the word of christ dwell in you richly it is the word he spoke it is the commandments he gave. All these that he gave, when we take everything, they will nourish us and they will also feed us and they will strengthen us. But then it says, if you come back to Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 8, it said, they will eat with unleavened bread. That means every form of leaven should get away from them, should be taken away from their environment, from their house. Let's go back to that passage we read before and let us see what actually the leaven there is referring to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. How do you understand the leaven here? 
Leaven then means malice, wickedness, insincerity, and falsehood. In short, leaven will be a type, a symbol of sin. It doesn't stop there. Leaven is also a symbol or a type of false doctrine. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And here we're looking at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Actually we should have read from verse 6 to verse 12. But our time is slipping away from us. Our time is going very fast. Therefore I will look at verse 6. And I will look at verse 12. It, then Jesus said unto them. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And the disciples were wondering. They thought he was referring to ordinary bread. And look at verse 12. It says, Then they understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the leaven of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So then when it says they will eat that lamb, the flesh of that lamb, in Exodus chapter 12, with unleavened bread, it means that they will get rid of sin, they will get rid of false doctrine, of false teaching, erroneous, crooked doctrine, because, you see, that is the only way you can really enjoy Christ. If you are still married to uh, the false prophet, how can you enjoy the doctrine of Christ? If you are still so attached and so associated and so intimate, with the false teachers of the day. How are you going to be able to get nourishment and strength from the Lord Jesus Christ? If you really want to keep the feast the way the Lord wants it to be kept. Get rid of sin. And that is what you do when you are coming into Christ. You are coming to the kingdom of God. You repent of sin. As you repent of sin, you also make sure that the sin it does not come back even after you are born again. And then you make sure that false doctrine doesn't come. You make sure that false teaching will not be in your life. All the books of the occult, all the books of false doctrine, all the books of the false prophets, you burn everything. All the cases of erroneous doctrine, you're going to throw everything away and burn everything. It means that you are partaking of the flesh of the lamb without any leaven. Let's come back to Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 8. Exodus chapter 12 verse 8. They shall eat of the flesh. In that night, and it, then it says, roast with fire, and on living bread, then it says, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. What is this one with bitter herbs? Well, it is telling us that there are some things that happen uh, to the children of God when you come into the kingdom of God, and you are feeding on Christ, and you are feeding on the word of the Lord. Persecution will come. Harsh persecution. Hard, terrible persecution. And the persecution that will look very, very bitter. That is what you read in Second Peter when it says that you fall into diverse and manifold temptations and trials and persecution. But then it says it is a trial of your faith. And Jesus Christ even said, do not be surprised if the world, if the world hates you. You know that it first hated me before it hated you. So then it says with bitter herbs. In verse 9, eat not of it raw. Or sodding at all with water, but rose with fire, his head and his legs with the pertinence thereof. The word pertinence there just means the internal part, the inward part. It is telling us that we are not to reject anything of Christ. The thought which is coming from the head of Christ, the walk, the lifestyle which is coming from the legs, the internal part, the thing that he tells to his bosom disciples, his beloved disciples. The things that he gave unto them specially, that he interpreted unto them, with the pertinence, the internal parts thereof. And in verse 10, ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, that that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. In verse 11 it says, Thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This verse 11 is very significant, isn't it? They were to look forward to the journey. And they were to know that their time of departure was very, very near. And as their time of departure was very near, they will, see, uh, they will act as if they were immediately to begin the journey. While they were protected by the blood of the lamp within their houses. And also they were to eat of the flesh of that lamp. 
when it says your loins girded. You see, it is uh, like if you know the dressing of the Jewish people, they, were, they will be wearing the flowing garment. And so they will tuck in the, the loose parts and the flabby parts. And then they will put a girdle. That's why it says your loins girded. Isn't that what you, if a person is uh, wearing a, a robe that is flowing, even in our nation here, and is riding motorcycle, you know, it will not be convenient at all. It will impede, it will hinder his movement or his speed. And therefore, he will talk in all those flowing paths. He's telling them, get ready for the journey. And also your shoes upon your feet. As if, uh, you know, you are ready and you are going to walk through the wilderness. There will be snakes and there will be scorpions and there will be dangerous things. Have your shoes on your feet, ready to depart, and your staff in your hand. You know, if people are journeying through the wilderness, they will need the staff. It's just telling us something. That as they were partaking of the lamb, they will partake of it in the mood of expectation. Isn't that a lesson for us today? That as we partake of the word of God, we partake of the word of God in the mood of the expectation that our going from this world may be any time. Our leaving this veil of darkness and this shadow, the, the land of the shadow of death may be any time. And that because of that, our loins should be guarded. Well, we don't have time. If you read Ephesians, you will see all that this is talking about. Your loins guarded, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And if you look at a, a First Peter, you will see that we, as pilgrims and strangers in this world, we shall not allow even fleshly loss or the cares of life or anything to distract our attention from the journey that is before us. But then, according to Hebrews chapter 12, we'll now start to run with patience the race that is set before us, laying aside every weight and every besetting sin, so that we'll be able to make progress on our journey. There is a lot, but let us pass on to point number three. Point number three is when I see the blood. When I see the blood. Exodus chapter 12, we're reading it from verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Well, let us stop at that verse 12 for a moment. Hear the threat that God had given before. You see, God is a consistent God. That is something we need to learn about God. Have you seen that in all these passages that we're studying, that when God says something, he keeps to it. He doesn't change his message. He says, I am God, I change not. That is why the word of God has told us, if we are children of God, meddle not with them that are given to change. Now, let me show you. That even when God appeared unto Moses, he had given him this message. And he had told him that if Pharaoh will not allow the people to go, he will strike his firstborn. That his firstborn will have to die. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, reading from verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou wilt refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn son. Now you will see that God was very clear about this, that judgment will come upon the firstborn in the land of Egypt. In fact, very recently to this time, God had warned through Moses and Aaron. He had warned Egypt and Pharaoh as well. Exodus chapter 11, from verse 4. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that seated upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of the beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. So you see, the Lord had given the warning. And in, consist in consistency, uh, consistent with all that he has said before, 
he reminded Egypt again that that judgment was coming. That judgment was coming. Coming upon them. But then how did Israel escape that judgment? How did Israel escape the execution of the judgment of God of the firstborn dying? That leads us to verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token. That what token means a sign. The blood shall be to you for a sign upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now though that verse is very significant. You see, there are many people that might be able to quote a part of that verse, but then they do not know the full implication. The full interpretation and application of that verse. Actually, you know from all that we have studied, this is pointing in the ultimate sense, in the fulfillment of it, to the blood of Jesus Christ. The whole value of the blood of the Pascal lamp here, laying is being a type of the blood of Jesus Christ. Here is the divine authority for our regard in Exodus chapter 12, as a type of the Savior's work, on a cross of Calvary. In fact, is this Pascal lamb that will be a, it was a sacrifice unto God, and then it became food for those that were sheltered beneath its blood. Let's realize this that death must be inflicted upon either the guilty transgressor or an innocent substitute. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth it shall die. But then we are told that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man for the children of israel it was a lamb the lamb without blemish that tasted death for all the israelites and the sign that death has already occurred is that they will put the blood upon the lintels and upon the doorposts because when the angel of death the angel to execute the judgment of god when he saw that blood he knew that a substitute had died he knew that the innocent had died for the guilty. The same thing today when Jesus Christ, uh, when you know that he has died for you. And by faith, you apply the blood of Jesus Christ upon your heart. And you believe, oh yes, he died for me. He shed his blood for me. And by faith, that blood is sprinkled upon your heart, upon your life. Then that blood upon you is a sign that the innocent has died for the guilty. The perfect has died for the imperfect. The just has died for the unjust. And therefore the judgment of God will not be upon you again. It is that blood taken and sprinkled upon the doorposts and the lintel of the house wherein the Israelites were sheltered that actually protected them. What does the Bible say in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22? Without the shedding of blood is no remission. But then think about these children of Israel. It was not only that the blood was shed, the blood was sprinkled. Two things. Number one, shedding the blood. Number two, sprinkling the blood. You see, the shedding of blood provided salvation for them. Provided remission of sin, forgiveness of sin for them. It was the actual sprinkling. Putting it upon the doorposts, upon the lintels that actually protected them and gave them the salvation, the redemption, the protection they actually wanted. Look at it in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 28. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 28. It says, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. Not just the shedding of the blood. You see that? Not just the shedding of the blood. And the sprinkling of the blood. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. What's the implication? If they had not sprinkled the blood, then he that touched the firstborn would have touched them, would have destroyed them. That means if any Israelite was careless, he killed the lamb, he shed the blood, he collected the blood into a basin, but he just left it like that, never applying it to the doorpost or to the lintels of the house. That means although the propitiation, the appeasing, or the, the legal satisfaction of the judgment of God was available. But then because he did not appropriate it. Because he did not apply it. Then he will not be saved. He will not be secured. It's the same thing today. 
the blood of Jesus is already shed. Does that mean everybody is saved? Does that mean everybody now is protected from the judgment of God? No, there must be a personal application of the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. It is not until the sinner applies the blood by faith that that blood avails for him. And let me tell you this. Look at two different houses I call house number one, house number two. Now in the land of Israel. What if the blood was upon the first house, house number one, but it is not, it wasn't upon house number two. Will the blood on house number one avail for the house number two that didn't have the blood? The answer is no. The blood above your neighbor's doorpost will not save your household from death. The application today is this. Your father may have the mark of the blood upon his own heart. Jesus Christ washing him, cleansing him, protecting him from the judgment to come. If you have not done it as a child, your father's salvation is not sufficient for you. The sprinkling of the blood upon your father for salvation, for redemption, for forgiveness uh, is not sufficient for you. There must be an individual personal application of the blood of the lamb upon you. The one for the husband, my, uh, my sister, is not sufficient for the wife. The one for the parent, my uh, uh, brother, is not sufficient for the son. And the one for the children, not sufficient for the parents either. There must be a personal application of the blood. An Israelite might have selected a proper lamb, a lamb without blemish. He might have slain it. But unless he applied that blood to the outside of the door, the angel of death will have to enter in into that house to kill the firstborn in like manner today it is not enough for you to know that the precious blood of the lamb of god jesus christ had been shed for the remission of sins of the world a savior provided is not sufficient he must be received in a personal way you must exercise faith in his blood you must rely on the shed blood of the lord jesus christ as the sole ground as the only basis of your acceptance with God. When the execution of God's judgment saw the blood upon the houses of the Israelites, he did not enter. Why didn't he enter? Because death had already done its work there. The innocent had died in the place of the guilty. That which was without blemish, the Son of God, had died for that that had no soundness in it at all. And justice had been satisfied. You see, to punish twice the same crime will be unjust. So, those within the blood-sprinkled house were saved. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. God's eye was not upon the house as such. It was upon the blood on the house. See, a house might have been a lofty house, a strong house, a beautiful house, a magnificent house. This made no difference. If there was no blood there, judgment will enter and the deadly work will be done. Its height, its strength, its magnificence availed nothing if the blood was lacking. On the other hand, you picture a house among those houses of the children of Israel. That house might have been a little poorly built hut. If the blood was upon, the, upon its door, those within it were perfectly saved. You know, the, the application today is this. A person might look high. Great status, great education, great civilization. A person might look even very religious. If the blood of the lamp has not been applied upon his heart in a personal way by faith, there will be no salvation. On the other hand, a person might be an illiterate, knowing next to nothing. If the blood of the Lord Jesus has been sprinkled upon that heart, upon that life by faith, then that person will be saved. That person will escape the judgment of God. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. God is saying the same thing today. If you are under the blood, the mark of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are safe and you are secured. Neither the devil nor your past life can condemn you in the sight of God anymore. When the blood of Jesus Christ has fully cleansed you, I want to encourage you. If you have not been saved... Although Jesus died for you, if you have not personally applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ upon your heart, upon your life, for the forgiveness of your sin,
for the redemption of your soul, for the salvation of your soul. You should do it today. Receive Jesus Christ for salvation. Rest on God's word for assurance and peace. You know, if you have the blood of Jesus Christ applied already, then you have escaped the judgment of God. You pass from condemnation unto life. You pass from death unto life. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Are you relying on your good works? And you don't apply the blood of Jesus? Are you re relying upon your religiosity? You don't apply the blood of Jesus? Are you rely upon giving money to the beggars? You have not applied the blood of Jesus? Are you rely on your regularity in a particular denominational service? And you have not applied the blood of Jesus Christ? It is the blood. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. His blood has been shed. Let it be sprinkled upon the lintels and the doorposts of your heart. So that the Lord will see that blood and then judgment will not come. Judgment will not come. The wages of sin is dead. But we thank God there is a gift of eternal life with the Lord. As you call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to come into Christ today if you have not already done so. If you have done so, please remain secured under the blood of Jesus Christ. I plead with you, don't backslide. Don't, don't come out of that uh, blood sprinkled uh, house. Make sure you remain in security with the Lord. Let there be no leaven. Let there be no false doctrine. Let there be no sin. Let there be no insincerity, no fraud, and no hypocrisy, no wickedness, and no malice, no iniquity. You call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I come for refuge under the mark of the blood of the Lamb. I want you to rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. If you have faith in the blood of the Lamb, you will be saved. Your sins will be taken away. Your sins will be cleansed away. He says, here is the blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of the sins of many. If you will believe today, it will be for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you.